Uh, good afternoon once more. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome every one of you into this session. And I'm sure everyone is looking forward to this uh, great session that we are about to have now. Um, without any waste of time, I would request uh, for all of us, as you all know, that um, you have to remain on mute so that you don't disturb the session. I will, I, I, I will kindly ask each and every one of us to please mute themselves before we start with the session. And again, for those who don't know me, my name is uh, Vidolia. I'm the marketing and event coordinator for ISCA. And um, going forward, if you happen to have a question during the session, uh, please, uh, actually during the presentation, please write it in your chat box and then we'll notice it and then we'll take it up after the presentation. And if you would like to present your own question to the speaker, you'll be given the platform to do so only after we are done with um, the presentation. As you all know, we have our guest speaker for the day. Our guest speaker is uh, Dr. Is God, uh, Dr. Godwin. We do have uh, Dr. Godwin uh, Guamarira amongst us, who's going to be leading with the presentation. I'm just gonna go through a little bit of his bio so that you know uh, his background or the kind of person he is. Like I said, I am requesting everyone to please, to please mute yourself so that you don't make any background noise. Okay, um, Dr. Godwin Kwemarira is a PhD holder from Makerere University in public interest. He has earned his Master's of Business Administration, Project Management and a Bachelor of Human Resource Management from the same university, which is uh, Makerere University. Uh, Dr. Godwin is a governance and HR specialist. His research interests are in HRM, public personnel management, public accountability, com community ethics, nonprofit leadership, sound governance, civilization, citizenship, uh, values and public interest. Uh, Dr. Godwin is a university teacher or lecturer and currently offers lecture lectureship in the Department of Leadership and Governance. Faculty of uh, Management at Makerere University Business School. He is also an associate consultant at Uganda Management Institute. He has published in globally respected journals like Kwamarira G, Ntai MJ, and Munene JC in 2019. Uh, accountability and public interest in, govern in government uh, institutions. So without any waste of time, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Kwemarira. Uh, he will just take you through his uh, background if he feels that maybe there are some things that I might have uh, left out. And then uh, he will continue from there. Uh, Dr. Kwemarira, I'm going to now hand over to you and you can just uh, put your slides in a slight mode so that it can be visible to everyone. And thank you again for coming on board. You can now take over the platform. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, my sister from South Africa. I am Godwin Kwemarira from Moves. Our people from South Africa, I bring you greetings from Uganda. Uh, I think having seen my image, I can now put off the video and we talk academics. Uh, thank you so much, my sister Vinoria. Uh, when we went into COVID, I started teaching in one of the faith-based universities here. So every time I'm going into lectureship, I begin the episode with a word of prayer. So I can see a number of people online. Is it okay if you choose one to lead us in a short prayer or I can give any of my friends? I see Dr. Maxwell. 
Paul, you can give us a short prayer if you if it is okay with you, doctor. Give us a short opening prayer, then we can begin today's syllabus. Over to you, Dr. Maxwell Paul. A short prayer, please. Vinoria, is it okay if you give us a short opening prayer and then I'll kick start the episode? Oh, oh, okay. Um, I'm honored. Um, okay. I bet everyone is closing their eyes. Um, thank you, Lord, for bringing us together here. And we'd like to thank you for life. And we'd like to thank you for this session as it's going to go today. And we hope that everyone will benefit from this wonderful session and would we'll like you to lead amongst us. And um, we thank you for each and every day. And I would like to tell everyone to please say amen. Uh, thank you so much, my sister. Uh, we are going to move through the theme of preparing and submitting your dissertation for Thethys. I once again bring you greetings from the Department of Leadership and Governance Faculty of Ma Management of McKay University Business School, where I do teach. Uh, the structure of the presentation shall be we shall have different types of PhD. I'll give a short basis, and then I'll emphasize the PhD, the one that I did, which was my research. We shall have background to the study. What is expected of the background of the different studies stemming from whichever university you're coming from? I'll also give my food for thought on the theoretical review. I'll also highlight literature review, methodology. I'll move through results and discussion and then conclusions and implications. I also highlight the politics that you must pay attention to when you're doing your master's or your PhD. And there are different types of PhDs, but I'll highlight on the three leading ones. There is the one where you get a concept of study, maybe you want to pursue a concept called green procurement. Now, if you want to do green procurement, you meet with your doctoral committee, the supervisor, different universities have different cultures. Where I did it from, the minimum number of the doctoral committee are five. There must be five PhDs. So you I meet, when you meet design, can you hear me well? Vinoria, confirm that I'm loud and clear. Yes, you are audible enough. Thank you very much. So I was moving us through the different types of PhDs and I highlighted three, the leading, but at the end, I'll also talk about others that are not common. The PhD by publication you meet at the beginning of your research study, at the beginning of your maybe masters, you agree on three research objectives. If you're going to do green procurement, for example, or public accountability or public ethics, whichever concept you want to pursue, you come up with three objectives. Now, each of the objective, you make a publication out of that. Now, when you make a publication out of them, out of the three objectives, you compile them in a book. You agree on the journals, the publishers. When you finish the publication, the university will give you the PhD. This kind of uh, PhD is common in the Scandinavian, particularly German. Then there's also the one that is common in a number of African universities. That is the PhD by research. And I'll anchor my viewpoints on the PhD by research. Because the PhD I did from McKinney was purely by research. You meet the supervisor, you agree on the topic, that one is sealed. You go on the proposal level. When you finish the proposal level and the five members of the doctoral committee members agree that you're good to go, you present. You cannot go to the next level until you've been okayed. But when the supervisors okay, it does not mean that you will pass. Sometimes they give you 
an okay that is diplomatic. They sign just to let you know to go, but when they are not at power, then they fail you. Then there's also the one, the one of PhD by coursework and later do research. This is consistent with a number of our master's studies. You first do the coursework component, the examination bit. When you're done, you go to the research. So depending on the university you're doing it from, and depending on the supervisors, and also your energy, these, these different PhDs, the approach differs. You must, wherever you go, first study the politics of that university. And let me go to the real deal. That is the background to the study. The background of the study differs. I've seen a number of PhD thesis from Europe. They begin from quotations. Others say the Bible. Others stem from videos. Others stem from catastrophes. Others stem from statistics. But whichever way you want to begin from, you must be strong enough. People must see that you're advancing issues. In academia, we pay tribute to you for advancing issues. And we crucify you for talking what does not constitute issues. So in the background, we want to see what are you advancing? What is the issue that you're going to talk about? Is there anything substantial that you miss if you do not pursue that study? Now, in the background, depending on the issue at hand, you must create a catastrophe. If it is green procurement, you must show its relevancy. If you're advancing the concept of conservation, if it is public accountability, if it is corruption, you must show that the, that is the problem in that, that uh, concept. You could stem from statistics. If you talk about, I've talked about corruption, you must show the money that is being lost in corruption. That is from a statistical angle. Now, a number of us are used to stemming from literature review, but there must be consistency of thought. The issues must flow. A number of you guys, one sentence does not talk to the second sentence. Neither does paragraph one talk to paragraph two. And you tend to write very long paragraphs. Ideally, on a page, you're supposed to have two to three paragraphs per page to create face validity. Now, every time you document something, you must question yourself. What am I advancing? A number of purposes demand that you stem from a historical paradigm. But this is what I found in students' work. They give related studies. Related studies do not constitute a historical perspective, no. The context, if you've chosen to move from the ancient times, you must flow maybe from the Greek uh, dominance. At one time, the Egyptians were on top of this world. You flow till today. Uh, my chair, Vinoria, permit me to talk about these three cases to advance the issue that I wanted to put across of the historical viewpoint. I'll give examples. Maybe I'll stem from the public health and talk about communication, emphasizing the flow of ideas. I also talk about market preferences and also COVID-19. And I also go back and emphasize the issues in the background chain. Now, if you're going to study public health or your PhD is about public health, we expect you to tell us how the, how the Africans survive from a healthy perspective. In, before the coming of the white man, how did the old man from the African continent survive in case he got sick? This is what happened. Wherever our forefathers lived and they got challenges from a health angle, they would go to the medical people. This can move that across us, the whole sub 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 Africa. If I got flu, we had the people who had specialized in curing it. If it was a pandemic, they were also there if it was malaria, whichever. If my sister wanted to give birth, they were renowned people across the continent who would do that. Maybe in circumstances of catastrophe, if there was a catastrophe, maybe I've married Vinoria and we are not giving birth to a kid, we would evoke the gods and the gods would give us an answer. That was the generic situation before the coming of the white man. Now, what happened when the white man came? I'll go to the context of Uganda. 
When the white man came, he came with the dispensaries. But after some time, the white man discovered that the, the dispensaries were not okay. They were not sufficient enough. So what did he do? He brought in the missionary hospitals. But these missionary hospitals were also very few. That is when the white man came. Now, towards getting uh, independence, Uganda, through the Work for Progress, designed 23 hospitals that looked alike. They are spread across Uganda. That was in the 1960s. Years. Uh, in the 1960s. You talk about public health in the 70s, 80s. Today we have the, the hospitals that have been built by the government. That is from a public health perspective. From a communication angle, you take us still to the ancient man. It was drums. I don't know the case of South Africa. But every time I go to my village, the drums are, are, are heard on Sunday to awaken people to do what? To go and pray. There are so many ways. The Vuvuzelas, I see them. I want to imagine that that is how the South Africans communicated. So what happened at a later date? At the later date, the public communications were built across Africa as urban centers. That is when the white man came. But they were also tedious. If we are going to make a call, you had to move around 300 kilometers. So we see the telecom coming in, the mobile phones. But also had challenges at the beginning. We used to pay uh, money, service fee per month. So that is how the, the concepts uh, keep evolving. I'll skip uh, market preferences and I'll talk about COVID. We all know that COVID stemmed from China in one. It also stepped on the African continent. The first case was cited in Egypt. You take us to have the first case in your country. In the context of Uganda, the first case was cited from uh, a, a guy who had gone to Dubai. You talk about the lockdown, how we are unlocked. The historical perspective of concepts should flow. Now, if you cannot come up with such stuff, you go to what we call seminal papers, the breakthroughs. Who are the leading scholars? Who are the grandfathers of these concepts? That is when you evoke the study. I mean, that is when you know the roots of the study. Now, how have other scholars been contributing on that concept? So the historical viewpoint, look for seminal works, search the engine. If you want to know, for example, communication in ancient times, you just go to Google and put the communication in ancient times public health like that and how it has been evolving. Now, a number of us are weak at the beginning points. The first sentence should be exciting. Academically, we call it a constant. It shouldn't be doubted about your study. The second one should be about the study. The third, you provide evidence about the questionable problem under investigation. Uh, members online, permit me go to the next slide. Uh, a number of us, our studies have theoretical viewpoints. The assumption is theories explain phenomena. For example, if I want to befriend my friend Binoria from South Africa, I don't go straight to her directly. I will scare her. I could choose to pursue it theoretically. I send her mobile money today. I skip about a week. I ask her to take her to the salon to do her hair. After another one week, I send her stuff from KFC. Here, the serious restaurant is KFC. I cannot go to Sheraton. I am communicating, but through a theory. This guy will have my to say, what is this guy advancing? Now, we talk through theories in academia. We must also be reminded that constructs the predictors of our studies are extracted through theories. I must also say that the summary of the theory comes from the assumptions of the theory. Under theoretical review, I always encourage students not to go past the page. Tell us what that theory is. Tell us what that theory means. You can only appreciate that through the assumptions of the theory. Now, when you finish that, how does the theory explain the study? What we call the applicability of the theory. 
one page is enough. I want you guys to go back to your documents and ask yourselves every time you write something, what am I advancing? What am I putting forward? Now, every time you finish, if you finish a section, give it to about minimum five people. Let them critique you. When they critique you, attend to the issues raised. A number of us fall in love with our stuff. That one is a killer. You must not fall in love with your documents. If you finish the theoretical perspective, <coughs> highlight three, four, highlight five guys. If you can access them physically, the data, give them hard stuff of your stuff. Let them write it there with their pens. If they say they don't like it, chances are high that it has a problem. And it just <coughs> now a number of you guys use mal theoretical. By mal theoretical, I mean many theories. I always encourage students to use one theory if they can. And the reason I give, if you use three theories, you must justify. And the justification is embedded in, in the limitations of the theory. If the theory A does not explain a phenomena, it means the second theory should be able to articulate that. That means that its weaknesses, if identified, are also articulated in another theory. <coughs> Practically, it is like this. If I want to get a second wife, I'll go to the stakeholders and I say, elders, about 15, 10 years or five years ago, you gave me my wife, Joan, but Joan doesn't love me anymore. I even suspect she's even bewitching me. She even, she is even threatening to give me medicine. I mean, uh, uh, poison, Joan, and I might not survive for a long period, and I suspect to die first. So my elders give me a chance to bring on board Miria. Miria identified her through a friend, blah, blah, blah. She appears to be God-fearing, should give me food of time, and even reduced weight. So the weaknesses in Lady A are addressed by Lady B. But why I don't go into my theoretical approach is that identifying the gaps and see how the subsequent theory will address them is a challenge. For example, if I'm using a theory called deterrence theory, deterrence fosters punishment. Godwin was supposed to be in class between four to six. If you don't be in class, you'll be punished. That is what deterrence theory is all about. I can come here and I don't teach. And I give students Woroko, so I take them to Arsenal, from Arsenal, I take them to the new prime minister of uh, England, from there I take them to the upcoming Christmas, I've not taught, I've given stories, students pay to be taught. So the theory of deterrence in that context neglects that. So which theory can address that? That is stewardship theory of people being good stewards. So if you can avoid going mal theoretical, the better. So under theoretical review, we are interested in one, what is the theory all about? Two, how does it explain the concept, the applicability? Do not write a lot. Question everything that you put forward. I think I've highlighted through that slide. Permit me go to the next slide. Now, literature review. The literature review should be consistent with the study's objectives and should capture the conceptual framework. I always encourage students to review latest literature, unless if it is a doctrine unless if it is divine, if it is the Abrahamic divine command of one paradigm, you have the biblical, then on the other side, you have the Quran. That one does not get outdated. The number of you, the Bible is as current as the today's newspapers. If it is a theory, we don't mind there. If it is a model, or if it is a movie, earlier on I wrote in the issue of love, you can say Titanic if you're crafting something around Titanic, I mean around love. So, but other than that, 
the studies should be current. Now I'll highlight how we go about it and I'll unshare the screen, but I must remind us that about the leading five publishers. That is Routledge, Ted and Francis, Wiley, Springer, Sage. The other one is Elzavia, I beg your pardon on that. Then I highlighted Emerald because a number of leading scholars publish him or contribute to knowledge in Emerald. Let me stop sharing and I'll take you here for something that you to emphasize what I'm advancing. Let me share again the screen. Now, I'll take you through Routledge. You just go in Routledge journals. Whichever concept you're pursuing, Vinoria confirmed that I'm sharing the screen and it is bringing Routledge, Ted and Francis peer reviewed journals. Yes, it's visible. Thank you. Now, if you want to study, let me say, you want to pursue democracy, you want to be a, a professor or a student of democracy, that is how you go about it. Any concept, be it procurement, green procurement, conservation, so a lot of stuff will come. You must also tell us where you're coming from. Are you in social sciences? Are you in education? That is on this side. Assuming you're in humanities, that is where I click. I always encourage students to go in for articles. So at least I've shown that. That is Routledge Day in Francis. I can now take you to Wiley. It is Wiley Journals. You go to Wiley scientific research articles. You click there. When you click there, if you want to say recycling, your study is about recycling. A number of stuff will come. So this side, if you want in the last two years, that is where you click. You want latest stuff. Are you interested in reference work? Those ones in encyclopedia, bulletins, journals. So that is how you go about it. A number of stuff will come. Now, when you're reading, you read and put in the context of your study because after your document, it will be subjected to anti-prejudice. How do you minimize it? You get an exercise book, read and put in the context of your study. That is how you minimize it. And you give as many people to critique you. That is why I might end at Springer. Springer, you just go to Springer link. You can look for stuff based on a scholar, If you want to be a professor of talent management, that is how you go about it. Are you interested in articles, conference papers, books? That is how you go about it. Let me end with the search and I'll show you what happens if you cannot access the articles. The journals. If you want to, sorry about that. If you want to study commercialization of politics, politics. Now you realize that the number of articles do not open. Now, if these articles are locked, you look for the doing number commercialization or citizenship, you click there. When you click there, this is the DOI number. 
you copy the link address. When you copy the link address, you go to what we call Sci-Hub. This is Sci-Hub. You paste the DOI number there. If the paper does not open, you try other types of DOI number. There are uh, many. That is how you can overcome that. Go to the DOI number, copy it, paste it. Let me go back to the document, my people, and then we carry on. So that is what happens. When you're reviewing literature, you should also remember the dimensions of a construct. Maybe let me talk about it in the next slide. Yes, I brought this to emphasize three issues. One, to remind us what the dependent variable is and what the IV is and what the mediating variable is. And I always encourage students to avoid the mediator. A number of you students and senior colleagues do not appreciate what we call the dependent variable. Whatever you're studying is called the dependent variable. In this context, a man is seated somewhere and wants a child. That man looks for a woman. Maybe let me bring something, a highlighter, point options. A man is interested in a child. This man looks for a woman. They meet at point S, a child is born. A child is the dependent variable because he depends on the car of a man and a woman. The number of our brothers are very dark. The woman is also very dark, but the child is brown. Now the woman starts giving and the uncoordinated stories. And the man is also not at par with the car of the child because they are not a replica. We call this a dependent variable because it depends on these affairs. The color here. My voice could be a replica of my mom's. My intelligentsia could be a replica of my father. Our parents know how unclever they were, but they are forcing us to shine. How do you shine when the parent failed? So the dependent variable depends on the independent variable. Now, if you include a mediator, you must demonstrate it in literature review. You must also craft stuff alongside it in the methodology. These are variables, they have dimensions. Before you go very far, unpack the construct, conceptualize it, break it down. The dimensions you have must be replicated in the questionnaire. When you conceptualize, it is assisting you to appreciate the construct. It's like when you know Godwin, he does not say the truth. He comes late. When you pay him, he does not present. What happens? You make him sign serious agreements. So that is how we come up with conceptual frameworks. Let's move forward, people. I felt I should use this conceptual framework to talk about literature review. If this is the study, this is the first path, this is the second path, this is the third. But before you go there, public interest in that study was unpacked to have common preferences, to have citizens with and egalitarianism. When you write a literature review, give us at least three paragraphs that is one page, at least, on the construct of public interest. Go and give at least one, one, one paragraph on each of the indicators. Talk about common preferences. And what I don't like is a student using one scholar more than once. There's a lot of literature, as we saw. So what do you do? Cite one person once in your study, unless if it's everything, unless it is a theorist. When you finish, this one tell us the theory that gave it to you, this construct. 
from which concept, from which theory did you extract the ontological ethical orientation? From which theory did you uh, conceptualize accountability from? Because earlier on, I showed you that a theory is a dream. From that dream, you extract a variable, which if you used one theory, which is possible, and all the three variables are gotten from there, you tell it to us. Constructs come from theorization. Now, constructs get their indicators from previous scholars. Scholars do studies, they do exploratory fact analysis and subsequently confirmatory analysis to get indicators. For example, the ontological ethical orientation, a number of leading scholars have agreed that it has the indicators of ethics of beauty and ethics of rights and justice. Value for money has the dimensions of efficiency, effectiveness, and economy. I've worked in the public service and I worked with the Inspector General of Government and many times we've been Serena in Munyonyo, they'll be telling us the famous three E's. Recent scholarship has added on equity and environmental something. That is what I would say. Now, when you're writing literature review, do not stop at only deontology and public interest. Evoke the dimensions. Talk about ethics of beauty and common preferences. Talk about ethics of rights and justice and egalitarianism. A number of us talk uh, only stop at the global construct. You've not done justice to that. When you talk about accountability, relate it to any of those. Because when you say accountability and citizens will, you're meaning accountability and public interest because citizens will is a replica of, is a dimension under public interest. Review and try to create what we call gaps demonstrate that indeed there is need for you to pursue the ontological ethical orientation and public interest because studies that exist have ignored the conceptualization. Maybe they are coming from, South from outside Africa. Maybe they've used case-based approach. Maybe they've used quantitative and for you, you intend to execute it using both quantitative and qualitative. Try to create a debate. Thank you. I'll go to methodology. I always encourage students not to say what they cannot defend in methodology. A number of times a student comes and says, I used cross-sectional. And I asked the guy, why, what constitutes your study a cross-sectional study? The guy does not know the meaning of cross-sectional. A number of you guys use harder words, ontology, epistemology, but you cannot bring them to social reality. Tell us the meaning of ontology in the context of your study. Do not define, because you can already get the studies from there. <laughs> ontology is largely about the reality of the concept you want to study. If you say green, what is its reality? If you say recycling, what is its reality? The reality is that recycling exists, no doubt about it. But our viewpoints differ. You all see it, but our perceptions differ. Now, because we appreciate that they concept of recycling exists. We are going to approach it. Approaching it is epistemology. It's about study. You're going to approach it from the two paradigm, from the paradigm that you all agree, which we shall use a questionnaire to collect the standardized viewpoints about us. Now, because we have the defining perceptions, we shall use an interview guide because the perceptions of Quema on corruption are different from someone in the village. A number of constructs coming from behavior science, standing from where you position, differ much as they exist. That is why a number of scholars use critical realism. 
Now, under the phenology, my prayer would be that we approach it from three semantic areas. One, what do you want to do? How do you want to do it? You must have a scientific justification. When you see me sight, night, and cross person, those are the people backing up exploratory sequential. Now, population, a number of students cite Craig's and Morgan, but they've not seen him or they've never seen that template. When you use Craig's and Morgan, if you're studying a billion population, the sample size will be around 380. That is the simplest sample size that I encourage students to use. If you're studying 1,000 youth, go to Craigs and Morgan. What does it relate to? Maybe I could go there. How much the time have I left with? Vinoria. Um, you have, uh, I think we, we, we went on for about, uh, about almost 45 minutes. So you can still continue. I have how many more minutes? Maybe that was the guide to this. Yes, you can just take us maybe five more minutes to 10 minutes is still Fine, hey, I guess. Hey, now then, yes. then I will not do that. Let me stop if I have less than 10 minutes. Let me continue the slides. Let me be yes. faster. Sorry, let me put in slideshow. I thought I had about 30 more minutes. Sorry. So one, the population should talk to the study construct, the byline, the topic, the unit of the analysis should talk to the unit of inquiry. If you're studying academic institutions, if you're studying academic performance, you're studying teacher performance, we expect you to go to a setting of academia. Now the unit of inquiry might be the teachers, the learners and the stakeholder. We rarely do that. My put for thought on the questionnaire and the interview guide on the questionnaire, my prayer is always that the background traits are at least over 10. When you collect data, you must discuss the background traits. The background traits, I mean the gender, the age, and when you write the age, try to be to you to evoke the power of appreciative inquiry. We fear growth, just set a question and put their bracket showing people the age within which we are born. When were you born and how old are you? They mean the same, but cognitively, they don't arouse our emotions the same. If someone has one year to retirement and you ask him when he was born, that person will tell you they are about, how old are you, 59? I'm about to retire, no. So the background traits should be as many as possible, minimum 10, and they should be consistent with the byline. By the byline, I mean the topic. Then let's also use the six point Likert scale, as in argued by Chomea. The reason is a number of respondents will go in for the five, the mid one or three, which is not so sure because a number of African people don't want to commit themselves. So they find they pride in going for the need, which is non-directional, that is five. For the interview guide, still I encourage you guys to use appreciative inquiry. Let me conclude. On the results, I have two of these. Why a number of you guys forget to talk about the profiles of the informants, the people that gave you qualitative. When you're writing your research reports, Remember to talk about quantitative and qualitative separately. A number of scholars that have had a chance to examine go in for the quantitative and then they keep bringing the qualitative quotations. And the qualitative findings are not only about quotations. You could talk about vignettes. You could talk about the pictures from the field, but you guys are interested in quotations. So why I brought in this, remember to bring us the profile of the key informants. 
And when you bring them, discuss them in the context of the study. This takes me to the second last slide. That is the perceptions. I did a study and a number of us talk about in vivo and say we use in vivo, but we've never used it. So academia demands honesty. If you have such a picture, these are the findings about how people perceive the concept of transparency. This is the meaning in the context of a school setting. This is the meaning of this. So I brought this to encourage us to use en vivo and not to say we used it when we've not used it. When we say rules and regulations, this is what it means. Punish, manage time, respect, decency, dressing, like that. Let me go to my second, my last slide. Other results present them and extract a meaning. First talk about the background traits, then you go to the hypothesis. If you wanted to examine the relationship between ethical behavior and teacher performance, what did you find? What does it mean? The study went to test out the relationship between teacher between ethics and teacher performance. It found out that, then you provide the statistical evidence. Then from there we extract the meaning. That is my food for thought on the, fire, on the results. Now discussion, you guys don't do justice on discussion. <coughs> what you do, you rush to the study findings. I mean to the studies that agree with the study. If you went out to study the relationship between ethics and teacher performance, give us at least minimum three paragraphs, that is one page, on the meaning, using the social reality, then give us the studies that support. And don't give us a lot, give us three studies and show how they support the study findings. At what point do they study? It is not about saying this study is in line with Quema et al. 2023. No, how does it agree? At what point does it talk to one another? About conclusions, the conclusion should stay from the findings. You guys just bring conclusions from the blue, from nowhere and test them there. The implication should be about policy, management, and ask academia, based on how you've been flowing. Uh, Viloria, I want to extend my honest appreciation. Thank you so much for giving me this challenge. I cannot take it for granted. I can only say thank you very, very much. To our audience online, thank you so, so much for foregoing the luxuries of this world to come and attend to us. Over to you, Vinoria. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so, so much for coming on board. It was very insightful indeed. And I can see through the engagement from our chat box that it was very, very exciting. And uh, most of the people are commenting that they like the practicality of um, the presentation. Actually, your practical examples are very relatable. So uh, without any waste of time, I, we do have uh, some good comments and we also have um, questions which are posed in our chat box. So I'm just going to quickly check on the questions and you can just answer them directly. Okay, I see that uh, we do have a question from Sarah Awinu, which says, will the profile of the informant apply in all cases? Uh, can one rely on number of years one has served in an organization? That is the first question from Sarah. You can uh, unmute yourself and answer the question. I beg your pardon on the question. Uh, the question goes like this. Will the profile of the informant apply in all cases? Can one rely on number of years one has served in an organization? 
Uh, you can also find it in the chat box. Maybe I must also say this, getting a PhD very fast or after a number of years entirely depends on the orientation of the supervisor. If a supervisor says one theory, you do not need to waste time. Just adopt what the teacher is saying and move on. It also depends on the university. Each university has its culture. And it also depends on you, the scholar. Today, if I would go back to a PhD class, I would use one theory, but I'd use the theory theories. But why must you get that degree with a lot of sweat? Whichever approach you use, <coughs> because these theories can explain a number of concepts. You can dream, I, too, uh, uh, I talked about the dream, and you go to different people and they give you different interpretations of the dream. It is the same thing. From one theory, you can extract a number of constructs. So it honestly depends. It depends on the university where you're pursuing it. It depends on you. It depends on the university. And I must also tell you guys, do not waste time arguing with the supervisor. Do what the supervisor wants. Because it's your small goal in this context. Yes, Vinoria. Okay, thank you so much uh, for that feedback. I hope that um, Sarah has been answered and it's uh, okay with the <coughs> feedback that you gave. Um, I have Victoria Kiboneka who feels that uh, maybe you should explain appreciative inquiry again and what it means in methodology. Appreciative inquiry is being indirect. Being indirect, not uh, having questions blown direct, and it depends on the context. I am a university teacher, <coughs> and a number of university teachers use protection to protect their uh, to protect themselves against STDs. But if you want to examine me, you'd say, Godwin, are you aware that these guys or your colleagues use ST, STD protection? <coughs> Excuse me about that, I'm failing to speak. I don't know why. Uh, sorry about that. I was giving you an example of appreciative inquiry and I was turning from the example that a number of, <coughs> excuse me, a number of university teachers use STD protection measures. But if you want to know whether I am using them, you don't ask me directly whether I use. You say, are you aware, Godwin, that your colleagues use? I would say, oh, yeah. You'd even go and ask how many do they use weekly? I would say, uh, uh, weekly they are not. But around this time, when the month is any, when they've been paid, they can use a pack per weekend. I am answering, giving you my viewpoint, my true picture, but indirectly. I also gave the example of age, where you don't ask how old are you, where you ask how old were you born. And there are there, these things exist online. I want to invite you to just say appreciative inquiry items on corruption, on those sensitive issues, on STDs, and its relevant and its related dimensions or predictors. Over to you, lady. Vinoria. Uh, thank you. Thank you so, so much for the feedback. And um, I can see that um, maybe you've been speaking for too long without uh, getting water. Maybe you can just quickly grab water and drink so that you don't cough a lot. Um, we're going to continue with um, the questions from my chat box. Uh, there's another question from uh, Mr. Paul, which says, um, is it possible to use only one theoretical framework for the dissertation or thesis? 
you know my sister your accent appears to be hard for me maybe because of the regions you have to bear with me i'll keep saying i beg your pardon and indeed i'm saying i beg your pardon again the accent okay i i i think even my network is contributing a bit because i'm having unstable network but i'll repeat the question the question is from mr paul which says, is it possible to use only one theoretical framework for the for the dissertation or thesis? Yes, it is possible to use one theory or one model for a whole research report, either at Masterio or even at PhD. But there's something that I said, it depends on the orientation of the teacher. A teacher what he or she was given. If a teacher is not flexible and they, uh, he was, got his PhD by only one theory, it will be hard. And you must also study the traits of the supervisor, the age bracket means a lot, the gender. Those are the things that inform us. So if someone used one theory, and you is not willing to learn about my theoretical approach. It is hard for that guy to adjust. So you can learn and you follow what the teacher is saying. And you can inquire tactically from the teacher. What is your opinion about the theories we should use in this study? And you use we. Say that the guy is brought on board, but when you say, ah, you say, ah, let you go and suffer. But when you say we, is inclusive, you know, politics from the way, from the way how you talk, bring the guy on board in a, in a, in a, in a, 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 a more relaxing and a more approachable, in a more, a way that brings him on board. Try to engage the guy and see his side of the story. And then move on. If the guy is one theory, then carry on with one. If he needs many, but either way, I've, I've, uh, maybe I need to interest you to go on PhDs online. The PhDs for different uh, universities are online. Depending on your study, you can say PhD on corruption, PhD on green procurement, PhD on network, a number of services will come. When they come through, through and see how they've done it. But the how they've done it, it doesn't mean that that is how you should do it at your university. Each university has its culture. You must move in your university's culture very, very fast and move forward. Yes, Vinoria, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Godwin. Okay, I'm going to take uh, one last uh, question from the chat box. And now, uh, after that, I'm going to open the platform to anyone who'd like to engage directly with you. So um, I have um, I have a last question from, from uh, Mr. Paul. Again, which says, I heard that for a thesis, one should consult more than 200 literature. Won't this be too cumbersome to arrange? Not really. Not really. You can review. <clears throat> I highlighted a few of the leading publishers. Now, if you went to each publisher, how many can you give, uh, can you extract? Maybe based on what I showed, you can get uh, 1,000 from each publisher, 200, 200 articles. Because why do we read? We read to be more knowledgeable. There are some things that the more you read, the more cleverer you are. I've seen people fail to defend their stuff. Maybe because they've not read extensively. You can get as more than that. To me, that when that the number highlighted is an understatement. You could do better. Let's aim at more than 200. 200, you're just beginning. 
Over to you, Vinoria. Okay, um, thank you so much. I'm now going to open the platform to anyone amongst the audience who would like to pose their own question to our speaker directly. If you have any question, you can just unmute yourself and ask directly to the speaker, or you can just uh, raise your hand and you'll get noticed and we'll give you the opportunity to do so. If there's anyone, you can just uh, unmute yourself. Um, I don't think there's anyone who would like to ask a question directly. I can see we have, I think it's a comment or, okay, let me just go through it quickly. It's from Michael Washington. He says you can, you can use software link uh, Zotero. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. It is free and it helps to organize citations. Yes, that's, that's you, you pronounced it correctly. I just wanted to add that uh, in relation to the comment made about the number of citations, there's some excellent software out there that's free uh, that helps you to organize your, your citations uh, and then put them in whatever uh, citation mode like uh, APA or uh, whatever style that uh, your 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 program requires. E excellent. It's free. I used it on my work, my dissertation work. It was very helpful. That, that's what I. Okay, thank you so, so much for that information. Um, okay, uh, Mr. Otieno Pania. You might off yourself from mute and ask yourself, uh, I mean, ask the question directly to our speaker. Unmute yourself, please. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Vinelia. Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Kwame. I hope I pronounced the, your, your name well. Uh, I, I think I've uh, really learned a lot today and known a few things that um, uh, probably I didn't know. I've added so much uh, information to uh, what I already had known. One of the things that we appreciate is that, uh, like what you've said, that uh, uh, different universities um, have different structures and, and formats. And uh, you also say that, uh, again, your PhD depends on your supervisor. Now, I, I just wanted to, uh, maybe from the background, uh, the information you gave us on the background, um, some universities will say that when you want to give, from your presentation, I saw like uh, uh, you're, you're trying to tell us now, we talk about historical. For example, you gave an example of health. Uh, you're talking about health, okay, something on health. Eh? That you said you start by looking at the historical aspect of health, now to the, um, to the current uh, issues about health. While some uh, some other uh, um, study says that you start you, you look at the uh, the aspect the genesis of uh, the problem of the study, you know you you try to find out the genesis of the problem of study and also try to relate whatever you are studying, uh, how I mean uh, how it has been addressed in other parts of the world, uh, from the university that I come from you 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 do it uh, globally regionally and locally. Maybe you just shed some light on the same. Thank you. Thank you so much, Otieno Panya. Uh, a number of universities have their different approaches. There are those ones that use the funeral turn down approach. Well, the, in the context of where I am, it is global. Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Uganda, then to the exact area. Maybe Mulago Hospital. Other studies do not mind. 
others, they want two pages of the introduction. Then you go to the problem statement. So what I was trying to bring out was what you said. I didn't emphasize that some universities dictate that the background be apportioned into historical, theoretical, conceptual, and contextual background. But me, my coming forward with that theme of historical was to emphasize the flow of ideas, not to give related examples. When you give related cases, when you give an example from South Africa, you give another example from Tanzania, and you give another example from Senegal, that one does not constitute a historical perspective. I wanted you to flow. And the flow from the ancient times to date is, most, is in most cases consistent what you say. A number of them begin from the Bible. For example, if you talk about corruption from the ancient, before you go to the ancient times, people say it is as old as mankind. They take you to look. Chapter, they extract cases. Then from there, they take you to the Greek philosophers. They take you to colonization. They are showing the flow till today. But my emphasis was the flow of ideas. Let it flow chronologically from then to then. I even went on to talk about Corona, where it started in, Ch in China, it came to Egypt, then to wherever you are in other countries. That is the plan. How is the case today? Over to you, Vinoria. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so, so much. Um, there was one person from the chat box with the hand up. So I, I didn't get note of their name, but if you still want to ask that question, you can just uh, unmute yourself and ask that question that you wanted to ask in your own. And I can see that we do have uh, Mr. Joseph Bukenya. I'm not sure if they want to ask a question because they've been off, um, they've been unmute for a while. Mr. Joseph, you can just ask the question if you'd like to ask one quickly. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, I'm sorry I came in a bit late though. I promised Dr. Gordon that I'll be on time. I was uh, just sending off colleagues, but I want to appreciate him for finding time to share with us things to do with research critical areas, especially when you are introducing an idea of research. And I concur with him. At UMI here, our approach background is that it's divided into four parts that he has talked about, the historical background, the theoretical background, the conceptual background, and the contextual. But even when you are presenting those, especially in the historical and contextual, you must follow the final approach that you have been talking about from global, regional, national, and then the local up to the level at which you want to, you know, talk about your unit of analysis. Thank you very, very much. Otherwise, it was a mistake to open my mic. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Joseph. Um, we do have uh, Mr. Olu who would like to ask you a question. So I'm going to hand over to Mr. Charles Olu. Uh, good day, afternoon, good evening, whatever you people are. And I think I just want to appreciate that um, the, 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 this discussion, I would call it a discussion because the concepts the marriage between the theories and the, the how to the, the concept of flows and the, you know the, the divisions of research and all that, although they have been just like defined, but with coming with the new approaches like mixed research methodology helps us to think beyond that. We can have a way where we can integrate like those people ask come back questions. How does this one fit in this one? 
So I think uh, the new development, and this is what we want to explore, and those who have done practical, like uh, the presenter here, having to have those experiences, yes, we, we can compartmentalize ourselves into the universities, and these things should also be now, universities should work together so that we don't have problems just thinking about this university, the other one, and this one, and this, the supervisor take advantage of that. And yet there's nothing which really is making them think that way. So with this kind of discussions, we shall open up and also make, uh, let me say, professionalize academic research. And this one, one area where in one university I am, it is the approach of mixed research. It was a very big problem, but it, it captures and integrates all this qualitative research, quantitative research, the approaches, this and that. So in Africa, we are burdened with this idea of even traditional matters cultural issues. Sometimes you find which question do you ask in other, and which language, you know. We are translating to another, from one this language to the other and might be missing the point. So what you have really said and these practical examples you have given, for me that I open just like Panya has said, uh, Tieno is coming from the university where also they are really burdened to say, if you know this one, it's not correct. If it's that one, then please explain. Things like that and you will be there forever and ever and yet you want to move out. So thank you for your contribution. And I think uh, with more of these ones coming, we, we shall be, if we find that it's a need to follow up and exploit more, I think uh, it's, a, I just want to appreciate, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so, so much, um, Reverend Olu for, for, for that comment. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to take one more question from the chat box uh, before we formally close the session. Uh, we do have a question from Victoria Kiboneka, which says, does a thesis carry more credibility if I use the research engines you mentioned, uh, like uh, Rutledge, Wiley, Springer, and the likes? Dr. Godwin? I beg your pardon. Okay, I'm going to repeat the question. Um, it's from Victoria Kiboneka, which says, does a thesis carry more credibility if I use the search engines you mentioned, uh, Rutledge, Wiley, Springer, and the likes? Yes, it does. You know, Google Scholar, a number of articles are in Google Scholar, but they've not gone through peer review but rarely can you proceed and be published in either Rutledge, Sage, why when you've not gone through uh, peer reviewed. And the assumption is that if it has gone, been peer reviewed, then it, had gone, it has gone through the needed science criteria, teasing out plagiarism. A number of tests are done, contribution to knowledge, but a number of staff are on Google and they've not gone through science. So that is why I chose those ones because they are known to go through science before you publish and they are rated. You can even search the net, those are the leaders. So my food for thought is that we adopt articles from there. Reason being those ones go through science. Thank you. Uh, thank you so, so much. Uh, there are just comments here in the chat box. Uh, most of the people are really applauding your presentation. They say that they have learned a lot from uh, your insightful uh, presentation. It was very, very um, educational. And uh, before we close with the session, um, uh, Dr. Godwin, would you like to maybe perhaps say, um, just make a few comments with regard to the presentation before we close with the session? Uh, Vidoria, at the beginning, I didn't appreciate you. I have three comments to make. The first one is to appreciate you. Please accept my genuine appreciation. Thank you for giving me the platform to share knowledge. 
I'll be willing to share more and more, except that I know that the time you allocate maybe is not enough. Maybe we could see how to go about that, but for now, my heart is full of appreciation. Thank you so much. And at the beginning of the episode, I said that I am used to prayers at the beginning and the end. So my prayer would be that when you're done, then we get a closing prayer. There is someone who prays for us. It's called Bridget. I saw her online. If it is okay with you, you give her a chance to close the episode. But from me, thank you so much and bye to everyone online. Thank you. Over to you, Vinoria. Uh, thank you so, so much. Um, I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Oluka, even if she's not here, for connecting me with such uh, a good spirit person. And uh, also thank you for coming on board. And Aiska is looking forward to more sessions with you just to share your knowledge um, with our audience uh, because you've been such a good um, presenter and also um, like uh, you are very, very uh, well organized with your presentation and people seem to like it a lot. It was uh, very educational and we'd like to connect more with you going forward uh, in order to um, get more insight from you. And also, uh, before we go, I would like to know if I'll be getting those slides, uh, the presentation slides from you. If it's possible, you can just email me. Because earlier on, I was presenting a paper in the conference, and I even left Oluka there. So Oluka is not here, is not with us, not in protest. We are presenting, and when we are calling me, we are having lunch. Maybe I also need to apologize for not picking up the calls. Sorry, I was taking lunch and uh, I left her there. I, and I know he's with us in spirit. So what delayed me is the lunch that delayed. I was presenting a paper, then from there I went for lunch. So I'm sorry, Vinoria. I'm going to share, let me share in the next one minute. I'm on the PC. Let me do so straight now. Okay, thank you so much. You can just share it with me in my on my email. And uh, we also going to have another session. The next session is going to be on the 10th of November. So uh, you can just get ready for another session that we're going to have uh, for our RSWS which is going to be revolving on a topic of writing papers and articles from your thesis or dissertations. So um, be ready and look forward to uh, having more engagement like this one. And for those who would like to get uh, the presentation slides, uh, as uh, Dr. Godwin has said that will be, he will be sharing the slides with me. So you can just email me so that you get noticed and then I'll also share with you the slides. And for those who uh, need our recordings, just to um, go back on the session and um, learn more from this session, we do have recordings. Uh, you can, they are available on our social media platforms. You can just go to our social media platforms. We are African, Institute for Supply Chain Research on all our social media platforms, with, which is Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and also LinkedIn. They are available there. I post them after a day after the sessions, and they are made available for downloads and um, viewing. So you can just get them from there. Um, thank you so, so much for being available for this session. And I will see you on the next session and have a lovely evening for them. Thank you, everyone, and bye. Bye.